Pope Francis has called us to a renewed emphasis on solidarity, the love of others, in the marketplace, in order to promote an economy that upholds the dignity of the human person and to foster greater liberty and prosperity. This is a profound message that everybody who has any connection with the economy can act on, starting right now. The new School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America is committed to building a person-centered economy, and it is our mission to answer the Holy Father's call. For this reason, we partnered with the Napa Institute to host a unique conference on the topic of liberty and solidarity, living the vocation to business. In the conference, we have CEOs and church leaders in conversation about how to promote Christian love within the economy. I hope that you will join us over the next eight episodes as we explore this theme in this special EWTN on Location series. Our first speaker is Cardinal Peter Turkson, the President of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace and Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Coast in Ghana. He's an influential and energetic public voice advocating for economic justice and human dignity around the world. It's a privilege for us to hear his reflections on what it means to say that business is a vocation, a theme that is so vital for Catholics today. But I bring you all very warm greetings from the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace in the Vatican. And on its behalf, we wish this conference great success. In, uh, in its mass, uh, introductory mass, opening mass, Pope Francis had uh, addressed the crowd that had gathered, saying, all those who have positions of responsibility in economic, political, and social life, and all men and women of goodwill are people whom I address. In the same vein, and in the same spirit of openness and dialogue, we gather to discover and to explore business as a vocation. And so while we welcome all of you to this conference, we wish to thank the Business School of the Catholic University of America. We've just been told it's 18, uh, 18 months old now. Uh, to thank you dearly and heartily for organizing this with the support of the Napa Institute. Accepting on behalf of the Pontifical Council to come before you this afternoon, to share these thoughts with you on business as vocation just makes manifest one thing that we need to understand very clearly at the beginning. It manifests the great and the growing interest of the church to providing guidance for the world of business. For the church believes that the thing to do is not to point fingers accusing finger at business, but rather to extend open arms to the world of business and to help professionals understand and act upon the social implications of their faith within business. The church therefore wants to encourage and to help entrepreneurs in their very difficult and challenging task of leading and conducting their business in these troubled times with a lot of challenges, with a lot of difficulties. And so in this spirit, is the, in this spirit then of a relationship encounter, we come to address these few reflections of ours, and we wonder whether this is really not what the Second Vatican Council left us as a legacy. And when we say this, what we mean is simply this. That's at the opening of the Second Vatican Council, Pope John, the, Pope John the 23rd had said that he wanted the windows of the church thrown open so the world outside can see into the church and so the church can see the world outside. That for us signaled a new kind of a relationship between the church and the world outside. And we in the Vatican know that this type of gesture, this type of expression of Pope John the 23rd gave rise to the establishment of several councils within the Roman Curia, which represent the new relationship that the church wanted to develop with society. So Council for Culture, Council for Interreligious Dialogue, 
Council for Christian Unity, and finally the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, which has got a task and a mandate of providing accompaniment to humanity in all its very many social endeavors and social undertakings. So coming together to, to do this, then, we think that we come to fulfill the desire of the Pope, his prayerful wish to see the church develop a new solidarity and respectful dialogue and affection for the human family, for its world, and for everything that constitutes its life and that everything that envelops the life of man in society. So St. Pope John XXIII wanted the church endowed with her gospel faith to enter newly into dialogue with the human family, with its world, about all these different problems. Because as the document, you know, Gaudium et Spes of the Second Vatican Council states, the joy and the hope, the grief and anguish of men and women of our time, these are the joy, the hope, the grief, and the anguish of all followers of Christ. So entering into dialogue with the human family, the church also engages human reason in all forms of human savoir faire, every activity that humanity engages in. And it engages in this dialogue with the light of its faith. Wherefore, all forms of human activity are seen in the light of the aboriginal activity of God, the creator himself, who then, as a result of his creative activity, created the world and created a human person in his own image and likeness. And so engaging human activity in dialogue with faith leads to the understanding of all forms of human activity in the image and, the, in the, in the image and likeness of the creative activity of God himself. Human activity then acquires the sense of evocation. And so in the light of her faith, the church understands human activity, especially those of industry, business, entrepreneurship, result and uh, research and uh, you know, discovery, as a response to a vocation to continue God's own creative activity. So created in the image and likeness of God and given the mandate to till and to keep the earth, human beings continue God's work of creation with every activity that they engage in. And so we wish now to deeply explore this sense then of business, uh, of human activity as a, as a vocation, look at the basic underlying principles, and draw a few conclusions at the end of it. So how may we understand business as a vocation? The Pontifical Council in developing this module wanted to adopt a formula, an imagery, with which it could accompany the different sectors of uh, human engagement. We did a small work which considered entrepreneurs and business leaders as having a vocation. That has had some great success. The booklet which signaled this work, which is very common and familiar here, is now translated into 15 languages. And from here, God willing, next month we'll be in Bangkok to present the Thailandese translation of this small booklet. So the invitation of business to consider itself as a vocation has become very popular. From this, we we, we, we tempted to, to venture into another area, and that would be to look at uh, political and political leaders also as a form of a vocation. And a few, business, a few bishops who have, who have called on our conference uh, this past few uh, weeks have suggested we do the same for the judiciary and have them also understand everything that they do in terms of a vocation. So under this image of vocation, which invites us to consider everything we do in relation with God and God's plan for, uh, for creation and for the human family, we, we go in ahead, you know, encouraging this type of reflection. So vocation, which used to be expressions that were used for seminarians for, for religious uh, orders and all of that, 
who are then said to have a vocation because they want to become priests, they will become brothers and sisters. It's, it's, now, it's now being taken one step beyond that. And we want to apply it also to the world of business and business people. So it simply means that one has a calling, a calling which comes from God, our creator. And so creation and everything created is purposely willed by God. Therefore, the meaning of everything that exists is determined with reference to God. Accordingly, the sense and the value of human activity are not fully understood and discovered without some reference to God, the God of creation. All human activity then affects the human person, his or her existence in the world and the world in which he lives. And these must all be related to God and be seen as a contribution to and a continuation of God's own work of creation. This fundamental truth, Pope Francis explained in his message at the beginning of this year to the World Economic Forum in Davos Clusters. The Pope said, and wrote to this group, business is in fact a vocation and a very noble vocation provided that those engaged in it see themselves challenged by a greater meaning in life. Such men and women are able to serve more effectively the common good and to make the goods of this world more accessible to all. And so business then belongs to such human activity. And entrepreneurs should see themselves as called by God to exercise their necessary and important skills and activities in order to assist in continuing God's work of creation. So properly understood in a way, business leadership indeed is a calling, a vocation and a very noble role that is exercised and played. And the church takes great joy in supporting and helping business people to respond appropriately to their vocation and to find a place of their activities in God's own design for human family and for the world. My dear friends, we know that business leaders are faced with intense competition, increasing pressure, and a lot of challenges to be efficient, to be profitable, and this on a very daily basis. Without these qualities, businesses will not survive but we also know that competition, efficiency, and profitability, and the logic of the market, these are not enough to foster the development of people in the world of work. What is needed as a support for all of this is what Pope Benedict presented as a logic of gift, some sense of gratuitousness in business that can order the logic of the market towards the good of all. For it is when human activity is inspired by charity, as Pope Benedict wrote in his encyclical Caritas in Veritate, the seventh paragraph, it's when the human activity and human work is inspired by charity that it anticipates on earth the kingdom of God the goal of all human history. So this logic of gift, which is proposed by Caritas in Veritate, has for Benedict XVI invite us in, to two things. The first is that every Christian is called to practice charity in truth in a manner corresponding to his vocation or her vocation and according to the degree of influence that he or she wields in society. The second thing is that the principle of gratuitousness and the logic of gift must find their place also within the normal economic activity and all forms of commercial relationships. This logic of gift then highlights the importance of acknowledging that our very lives and entire world we inhabit are gifts freely given and freely received from God. 
And this gift should inform how we act in our business endeavors. It is precisely this law of gift that humanizes and civilizes business, where business people see themselves as stewards rather than owners, their wealth as common rather than just private goods, and their employees as persons rather than only instruments of protection, uh, instruments of production. The danger for business people, and indeed for all of us, is that too often we take our gifts as our own private possessions, rather than as gifts that go through us to serve others. In Catholic social teaching then, this logic was expressed in Gaudium et Spes in these words. The human person who is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself, can fully find himself only through a sincere gift of himself or herself. Benedict XVI explains this, that this placement of the logic of gift within business is one of the great challenges before us. And if this logic of gift fails to animate business and its institutions, which is where much of the world works, then we will do great damage to the larger society. So an important insight, therefore, of understanding business in terms of a vocation or business as vocation is the conviction that business people or a business person is called not just to do business, but to be a particular kind of a leader of business. The vocation or the call is not simply to exercise and to do business, but to be a kind of a special kind of a business leader. Like any other kind of work, business then must confront what Pope John Paul II called the subjective dimension of work. Because work is not simply producing something outside a person, but work also changes not only the external world, but the interiority of a person, his creativity, his sense of dignity, and his own sense of appreciation of his own self. Our actions then at work, as well as in life, shape our own destinies, and they move us to a place within with, an, uh, with eternal implications. To these eternal implications, business as vocation points to the world with the words of Jesus, from everyone who has been given, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted and given much, much will also be asked. Business people then have been given great resources, and the Lord asks them to do great things. As Pope Francis said to the business people gathered in divorce, you have distinguished yourself in the way you perform, in the way your activities modify and change things. Please use the same one to lift people out of poverty and to help save the world of its poor conditions. This gifted character of business then carries social implications. Business leaders then have significant means to undertake something and with this comes a corresponding responsibility. Accordingly, understanding business as vocation, the church sees business not in terms of legal minimalism, do not cheat, do not lie, or do not deceive. Rather, the church sees the business as a vocation that makes an irreplaceable contribution to the material and even the spiritual well-being of humankind. It is about a meaningful life that opens the business person to God's will, and not simply their own will in the day-to-day -day decisions of ordinary life, which gives us the capacity to share goods in common and to build a community. This sense then of business as a vocation dryly leads us to basically underline and discover certain basic foundational principles that kind of make this possible. For the vision of business, 
which is generated in its encounter with faith, is grounded in and articulated in the church's social teaching or doctrine of the church. And at its center is the fundamental dignity of all human beings. who are created in the image and the likeness of God. This expresses God's infinite love for us. Faith denies that a loving God would wish untruth, bondage, injustice, and strife for us. Rather, based on divine love and human dignity, our faith completes, compels us, to embrace four fundamental values, namely truth, freedom, justice, and peace. Clearly, these values are not unique to the Catholic faith or Catholic perspective. Several monotheistic religions and faith share the same and talk about the same values. But because they are grounded in a divinely and lovingly created human nature, as taught by the Catholic social teaching, we have an absolutely firm response when such values are challenged or even denied. And so Catholic social teaching enunciates many other principles, some of which are especially pertinent to the world of business. For example, service to the common good comes before seven narrower interests. The goods or resources of the world have a universal destiny. Creation is a gift to the whole human family, not just to a part of it. And we call to act in solidarity with those who lack access to these goods, with a large portion of humanity who suffer in the midst of plenty. This vision of business is not without significant tensions and it's not easy to execute in today's world. There are many external obstacles that can prevent a business leader from shaping institutions in this way, such as the absence of the rule of law, or the absence of regulations, corruption, tendencies towards greed, poor stewardship of resources, and so on. Chief among these obstacles we make bold to mention is the greatest danger and probably the biggest obstacle is that thing of a divided life, which is one of the most serious errors of our age. The split between religious faith and the day-to-day -day business practices and activities can lead to imbalances and misplaced devotion to economic success. And this is a crucial point that we we'll probably you say just a second or two on. What this challenge of divided life calls for is that business leaders receive and accept what God has given, uh, has done for them, and to have this gifted life inform and order the way they give and enter into communion with others. When business people then integrate prayer, for example, the Lord's Day, the scriptures, the gifts of spiritual life, the virtues and ethical social principles into their own life and work, they live an integrated life and receive the grace to foster the integral development of all business stakeholders. So it is so important that business leaders succeed in bridging or overcoming the tendency to live divided life. I live my faith on Sunday and the rest of the week is my own work and my own concern. The encouragement and indeed, this has become the subject matter of the synod that was just celebrated about new evangelization because one of the trusts of new evangelization is also to encourage their overcoming this tendency of living divided life that Christians succeed in bringing their faith into whatever they do. Faith without works is dead. It's not only something we read in the letter of James, but it's something that must determine and affect the way we live, the way we do business, and the way we do everything. 
And so, by way of concluding these uh, brief remarks or observations about the consideration of uh, business as a, as a vocation, we want to say that at the end of the day, understanding business as a vocation is really the living out of the Christian faith, as faith that does justice, or as St. James would have us say, as faith that does works. Ours is a faith that has implications in the social order, and this may not be taken for granted. Before the summer, we received bishops who were on our liminal visit in Rome to the Holy Father, and when they came to our office, one of the bishops observed that the biggest problem in his diocese is the difficulty with which people have of seeing the social implications of the faith that they profess. So the social implications of faith is not to be taken for granted or to be assumed that every Christian sees the social implications of the faith they profess. And that's what we want to encourage with the social teaching of the church and inviting business people to see their faith as vocation. For the same reason, last, summer, uh, last uh, year in, uh, in September, we welcomed the CEO of big gold mining companies in our office because they had come to seek a day of reflection with us. And it's because, again, they want to see, they, have it, they want to develop a new way of seeing the mining industry and the way they work. They even proposed that they want to move away from calling the industry an extractive industry and call it rather human natural resource development industry because that sounds a little bit more positive and you know, fails to remind people of going to a dentist to have a tooth extracted or anything. So, so they want to also change the image of that industry. For the, same reason, for the same reason, we have met people in the world of finance, and I begin to explore with them also the possibility of developing the new industry in finance called by impact investment. So the thing about you know, addressing the you know, possible new forms of faith to the, the different businesses is a concern of our office. It's our own gentle and humble way of continuing this dialogue between faith and all forms of reason that was suggested already by the Second Vatican Council with the different engagements and the different occupation and, uh, you know, and appointments in society. So then, this vision of business is not without significant tensions, and it is not easy to execute uh, it in the world today. Respect for digni human dignity and the pursuit of the common good are the foundations of this rich heritage of the church's social teaching. With regard then to business and economy, they can be rephrased into three interconnected groups of objectives and characteristics that define the, good of, the goods of business. The first is that business can have as its objective the production of good goods. Okay, goods which are really good. And business, when and that's, this happens when business attends to the needs of the world by producing goods that are truly good and services that truly serve. They make solidarity with the poor a facet of their services to the common good by being alert for opportunities to serve otherwise deprived and underserved on 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 populations and people in significant need. The second objective is that businesses should provide good work. By organizing good and productive work, businesses make a contribution to the community by fostering the special dignity of, the, of human work. Businesses are communities, not mere commodities. Further, they contribute to the full human development of employees by applying the principle of subsidiarity that is by providing employees with opportunities to exercise appropriate authority, their own creativity, as they contribute to the mission of the organization or the business they work for or within which they work. The third objective is good wealth. By being good stewards of the resources given to them, businesses create sustainable wealth through efficient and productive processes, producing healthy profits. By creating wealth in a business 
is insufficient without the wider context of stewardship for the natural and the cultural environment. And so just the distribution to all stakeholders who have made the world possible, such as employees, customers, invited, uh, investors, suppliers, and even the larger community that ultimately serves as the market of the products. And so let us recall that business and workers are basically not to be considered as commodities. And let us also recall that good business is good for the common good. When business serves the common good, it is good business. And so with this brief and very humble, modest observations, we just want to wish to uh, contribute to the uh, you know, success of this conference and wish also to pray that God you know, will direct and inspire the discussions and all speakers who would address and share thoughts at this conference. And so pray that God bless the business school that is 18 months old, uh, still needs to make the first year, and that God bless this institution, and that God bless also the Napa Institute, which is supporting this venture, and that I pray that God bless all of you participants at this conference. Thank you for kind attention.